Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Genshin Impact, I can obtain adventure XP. Chapter 1, Chapter 1, Golden Light and Crossing Over. In a small rented urban room, the only light came from the street lamp at the corner of the building across the alley, shining through the clothes that were rarely washed for days and through the window. On the wooden desk that also served as a dining table, Nolan Walker was staring intently at the game screen running on his laptop. Due to the overly dark environment, blurred images were also projected onto his face, showing the Gaka banner interface in Tainari's banner. The lights weren't turned off to save electricity or anything. Ever since Tainare's banner came out, Nolan Walker had been using his previously saved primogems to wish, but unexpectedly kept getting the wrong 5 star each time. This was yet another soft pity where he didn't get the current rate up character. He continued wishing another 30 times without even a ripple. As a college graduate who had just graduated and became unemployed, Nolan Walker simply didn't have the means to top up and spend money. He could barely make ends meet with some side jobs. However, he didn't want to miss Tainari. So he painfully farmed chests, domains, and events for over ten days, saving up each intertwined fate he obtained. Now he finally made it to hard pity right before Tainari's banner ended. Nolan knew that with the guarantee system this wish would definitely get him Tainari. Thinking of the bittersweet past ten plus days, he turned off the lights in his room and sank into darkness, he was determined to be blinded by the golden light. This is the stubbornness of a loser, right? With his palm on the mouse? He slowly moved towards the wish button. Even knowing it was a guaranteed five star, he still felt a bit nervous before the moment of truth. Click. A crisp sound rang out as Nolan pressed confirm. The wishing animation began playing, a brilliant shooting star descending. He watched without moving, repeatedly chanting gold, gold, gold in his mind. In less than a second, the shooting star flashed golden, confirming that there was no error. He got hit. Although extremely excited, Nolan didn't have anyone to share the moment with and he wasn't in the habit of talking to himself, so he could only silently rejoice. One second, two seconds passed. Strangely, the golden shooting star on the screen kept expanding instead of the animation ending. Could it be a network issue? No way. At this time? He always played full screen which made him dizzy, so he could see the task bar showing his phone hotspot still connected fine. It wasn't a signal problem. Just as he was feeling anxious, the golden shooting star showed no signs of stopping at all. Could it really smash its way out? As if responding to Nolan's thoughts, the sound of breaking glass rang out. Cracks like a spider web appeared on a screen with golden light bursting out from within. Nolan's eyes widened but there was no time to think. The whole screen shattered and the golden light swallowed him whole, his consciousness going blank as the room was left empty. Boing, boing. Bouncing soft squishy noises that sounded like something jumping up and down. Still unconscious, Nolan turned over with an itch, it felt like sleeping on grass, the soft pointy blades brushing over his skin. Wait, wasn't I just wishing? As if realizing something, fragments of memories flashed through Nolan's mind, ending at the scene of being struck by the game's golden shooting star. He had just opened his eyes when a splash of water hit his face. Nolan instantly woke up. Lying sideways on the grass, in his blurred vision was a blue blob jumping up and down. He wiped the water off and propped himself up with one hand. His sight gradually cleared, it was a hydro slime? Hydro slime. Wait, that's too weird. What's going on right now? Nolan nutted his voice in some surprise. The soft and bouncy little thing in front of his eyes looked very cute, wasn't it the hydro slime in the game? It was exactly the same, could it be real? Could it be that he had been knocked out by the golden light for several decades, and nowadays game companies could use biotechnology to create fantasy creatures from games to sell? While Nolan was shocked, the sudden voice frightened the hydro slime. It angrily squeezed its body, poised to attack. Nolan had seen this scene countless times in the game, 
so of course he knew what it was going to do. Hey hey, wait, calm down. He instinctively shouted, getting up to run away, but it was a step too late. His raised butt was struck by the slime's bouncy body, knocking him flat on the ground. Luckily it was grass, a bit of cushioning not to be seriously injured. He was now 100% sure that this slime was real. In the end, it was a monster, even with its cute appearance, once recognizing Nolan as an enemy it ruthlessly pursued. It wanted to attack again. Nolan swiftly rolled on the ground, narrowly dodging an impact. He crouched there catching his breath. What's the situation here? Keeping an eye on the hydro slime, he reserved the strength to observe his surroundings, wanting to confirm if he had truly come to Tevat. Otherwise, how could such an identical hydro slime exist? The ground was grass, emerald like fresh sprouts. The sky was vast with white clouds and blue sky rarely seen in modern cities. To the left was a forest and to the right a clear lake. In the center of the lake was a small island with a statue of the seven. The hydro slime gathered its strength to crash into him again. Prepared this time, Nolan dangerously but narrowly dodged. This hydro slime wasn't the big variant. Its speed wasn't too fast. For him as an ordinary human adult, with preparation, he could also dodge it. Nolan looked at the slime which seemed to be more angry look. He retreated two steps towards the statue of the seven. The lake water was shallow enough to wave across. Getting closer to the statue, he confirmed it was undoubtedly the Anemo Arch and Barbatos's statue. Recalling the long familiarized game map, comparing it against his current surroundings, unsurprisingly, this was Starfield Lake. The scenery before him, the sounds of fish disturbed into swiftly swimming, the air carrying the scent of grass entering his nostrils, everything he saw, heard, and smelled told him without exception, this is another world. This, this is just too amazing. Nolan is just a bottom laborer on the earth, his life is depressing and hopeless, and only the expectation of his relatives is the driving force behind his continuous efforts. But effort doesn't always pay off in this society, otherwise, why would the vast majority still fail to succeed? Nolan wouldn't say he was fed up, but the meaningless day-to-day -day work had nearly extinguished all his passion. Luckily, he had the Tevat continent to accompany him, one of the few places that could bring him peace and quiet. He had long yearned for Tevat while playing the game, what child doesn't love to fantasize? So when he suddenly crossed over into Tevat, he had no doubts or disbelief about accepting this reality. He didn't have any strong attachments holding him back on Earth either. Since he was here, there must be a way back too. After all, Tevat was a land of supernatural powers, as long as he didn't give up, there would always be chances. And since both Lumen and Ether were from worlds outside Tevat and had some special abilities, it was normal for him to have something special too, like being able to control elemental powers by touching the statues of the Seven, right? Filled with anticipation, Nolan placed his palm on the statue of the Seven before him depicting Barbatos. A cool breeze blew by, but there was no reaction. His eyes widened in surprise. No, that's not right. Where was the promised elemental power conversion for other world travelers? Boing. Boing. The pesky hydro slime wasn't ready to give up the chase, splashing through the lake under dirt. Did it really have to hold such a grudge over such a small thing? It definitely lived up to being a monster. Damn, really no reaction at all no matter how long he kept his hand on the statue. So much for wishful thinking on his part. Well, even though he didn't obtain any special powers like Lumen or Ether, he still had to deal with the slime before him now. In fact, Nolan wasn't actually very afraid. He had defeated hundreds, if not thousands of slimes in the game before, even including Raiden Shogun herself. It's not that he also has such ability, it's just that now he's not completely ignorant about this unfamiliar world, and understands that as an ordinary adult, he can deal with this small type hydro slime if there's only one. At least running wise, it definitely can't catch up to him. However, Nolan didn't plan on just escaping. Instead, he wanted to try defeating it. After all, this was Tevat. Wilderness filled with monsters was commonplace. Living here, sooner or later one would encounter them. Also, if the information provided and game was accurate, slimes had a chance of dropping slime condense eight when defeated. It should be in demand, and if sold, could fetch quite a lot of mora. This would solve Nolan's penniless state after crossing over to Tevat. Otherwise, forget finding a way back, even just surviving would be troublesome. During Nolan's brief contemplation, the Hydro Slime used its bouncy body to hop closer and closer. Nolan used the Statue of the Seven as cover, blocking the slime. The slime jumped a bit to the left, so Nolan moved a bit to the right. It hopped right, 
so he stepped back left, repeatedly blocking its attack path. The not-so-bright slime was extremely annoyed, deciding to just charge and smash this obstructing pillar, gathering strength for one big jump. Boing! It dealt no damage whatsoever to the statue and bounced back, rolling on the grass. Due to its physical composition, the water slime temporarily lost control of its body as it tumbled. Now was his chance. Seizing the opportunity, Nolan leapt forward, pounding the small slime's body wildly with his fists. Punching the jelly-like slime felt soft and springy, it wouldn't hurt his hands. After over a minute of punching and kicking for all he was worth, the slime finally dissolved into a puddle of elemental water on the grass, defeated. Unfortunately, no slime condense ate formed. Nolan felt somewhat disappointed. Just then, an emotionless voice sounded in his mind. Defeated a powerful enemy, obtained 32 adventure experience. W what? Nolan was stunned at first, but then he saw a familiar interface appear in his vision. Name, Nolan Walker. Level, LV.1, 0100. Race, human. Title, none. Inherent talent, entangling affection. Skills, none. Specialty, descender. Adventure EXP, 32. Wasn't this a Tevat fan-made minigame that had become popular online recently? Nolan had also downloaded and played it before. Players would gain adventure EXP from defeating enemies, which could be used to increase their level or skills. Innate talents were randomly obtained by each player and provided special titles, like, Honorary Knight, Flying Champion, or, Unconferred Flower. Unfortunately, Nolan didn't have one yet. Skills had to be learned and trained. Specialties came from adventuring experiences, the more bizarre the experiences, the higher the chance of obtaining a specialty. He hadn't expected this fan-made game to cross over with him too. He was worried earlier about how to survive in Tevat without any abilities, but this was just hitting the jackpot. All those times he rolled the gacker just to build up pity must have paid off with his streak of luck. Only Nolan could see this panel. He tapped on the explanation for his innate talent, entangling affection, to see what it did hoping it was a good one since that mattered a lot to players. You were once struck by the golden light of entanglement, awakening this talent within you. After interacting with characters, you will unlock corresponding affection levels. Upon reaching max level 10 affection, you shall obtain empowerment from their arch and seats. However, this character scope is limited to the opposite gender. Based on the description, his innate talent seemed similar to the affection system in Genshin Impact, except at max level he would obtain some special arch and empowerment rather than a name card. He didn't know what the exact effects would be though. It definitely wouldn't be easy to fulfill the conditions, since max affection represented complete trust and vulnerability with someone, requiring long periods of interaction to achieve. He could only let nature run its course. Nolan tapped on his other trait, the specialty descender. As he guessed, it denoted him as someone who came from outside Tevat, with no records on the world tree, similar to the Traveler. And that was it for effects. The current 32 exp was from defeating the Hydro Slime earlier. It wasn't enough to increase from LV.1 to LV.2 at 100 exp, he could only put it aside for now. In any case, he was no longer empty-handed in Tevat. The days ahead were worth looking forward to. Few seeing the fan-made character panel that crossed over with him helped Nolan relax his emotions quite a bit. Next, he just had to find ways to gain adventure EXP, increase his level, and steady his footing in Tevat, to witness this splendid, fantastical world. And so, Nolan Walker turned his gaze towards the fish swimming in Starfell Lake. If he remembered right, defeating them would also provide adventure EXP according to the character panel. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 2 Chapter 2, Mondstadt. Defeated a powerful enemy, obtained 5 adventure EXP. A black back perch was knocked out by Nolan Walker with a rock. Fishing was more difficult than he imagined, especially for a novice like Nolan. Without any tools, his entire body was drenched before he managed to catch just 3 fish, each granting only 5 EXP for a total of 15 points. That was far less than what the slime had given. Added to his original 32 points, he now had only 47 still quite away from leveling up. He recalled it was night time when he crossed over, and some time had passed since then. Judging by the sun's position and height, it should be early morning now. Adventure EXP couldn't be rushed. He had to make it to Mondstadt City before night fell, otherwise being stuck outdoors with monsters and beasts roaming in the darkness would be too dangerous. He was still just an ordinary person, and he couldn't deal with two powerful monsters. 
let alone Hill it churls, even a single wolf could easily finish him off, abruptly ending his Tevat adventures. That wasn't what Nolan wanted. He had to remain prudent. Starfell Lake wasn't too far from Mondstadt. He remembered from the game's map that following the road through Whispering Woods would lead him there. Hopefully, there won't be any discrepancies. It'd be best if things matched perfectly. Nolan walked on the dirt wilderness road, carrying three tied-up black perch in his hands. In his heart, he was a little regretful that he had gotten his clothes wet because of these fish. With the wind blowing over to cool him, he was worried that he would get a cold. It was all due to his burning eagerness to test out the character panel. R. Nolan, you should have been more careful and restrained. On the surface, he didn't show, but in fact, he was still super excited about having a character panel, and only now did he calm down a little. The road from Starfell Lake to Whispering Woods was unexpectedly long. Reality seemed far vaster compared to the game. That wasn't too surprising though. The information provided in the game may be correct, but it is not complete. Like right now, this stretch of road, in the game, it'd take just seconds of controlling the character to pass. But he'd already spent over ten minutes walking and still only saw the first traces of the forest trees. Nolan reminded himself that the prior game info could only serve as a reference. He absolutely could not blindly take it as the standard. The reality was far more complex than any game. After walking a bit more, he entered Whispering Woods. Due to the dense foliage and branches blocking sunlight, the environment was much dimmer. Though monsters didn't litter the place, there were still wild beasts lurking in the forest that warranted extra caution. However, he currently followed the main road where adventurers and knights of Favonius on patrol often passed by, so regular beasts tended to avoid the area. Soon he would reach Mondstadt City though, how would he find lodging there? He had no more or sellable goods on hand. Nolan glanced at the black perch he carried. Rely on them? How much more could they fetch? He felt somewhat worried over that. Oh well, with no other options, he could only head to Mondstadt first and figure things out from there. Even sleeping on the streets was better than the wilderness. Suddenly, a voice called out from up ahead. Huh? Are you an adventurer from Liu? Why are you soaked all over? Following the voice, Nolan first saw a pair of curious eyes and a fair complexion, before his gaze was drawn to the cute red bunny ears above her head. He also spotted the goggles hanging around her neck. A familiar name surfaced to mind. Amber the Outrider. Nolan was slightly surprised to meet a familiar face so quickly. He remembered during his initial explorations, taking Amber in his party saved quite a bit of trouble when solving world quests. Nolan remembered Amber's identity in Mondstadt very clearly, Outrider Amber, reporting for duty. He could almost still hear those words ringing by his ears. And she thought I was an adventurer from Liu? Well, with his looks, it was understandable others would assume he was from Liu. But how should he respond? Should he admit the truth? The traveler with their immense strength could proclaim being from another world, but he didn't have such capabilities. And the reality was far more complex than any game. Claiming a foreign identity would just put him under the spotlight. If he drew even a hint of ill will, that spelled nothing but trouble. Yet he wasn't an adventurer either. A completely ordinary, average student like him could never fake that sort of bearing or habits. As thoughts spun in his mind, Nolan's expression fell as he replied in a dejected tone. I am from Liu, but not an adventurer, just a hapless fool bringing Liu specialties hoping to trade them in Mondstadt, only to get robbed of everything by the treasure hoarders. This excuse made a lot of sense. After all, large price differences did exist between regional specialties, so plenty of people transported goods from their hometowns to sell in other nations. Aside from hiller churls or other monsters, transports also faced danger from the treasure hoarders, who specialized in this business. Blaming them was perfectly reasonable. Treasure hoarders near Mondstadt again, huh? Looks like I'll need to report back and increase patrols around the area. Seeing the somewhat miserable state of the dirt and dampness on Nolan's clothes, as well as the fish he carried, Amber imagined him getting mugged and dumped in the wilderness by the hoarders. Starving, he caught some fish from the lake but was unable to build a fire, and he could not swallow the raw fish. Kind-hearted Amber gazed at Nolan with sympathy. Treasure hoarders are detestable but don't worry. Now that you've met me, I won't let you wander destitute outside. Come with me to Mondstadt first. You must change out of those clothes, otherwise, you'll get sick from the cold. Amber immediately perceived the difficulties faced by the Liu youth before her eyes. Providing aid to others was a knight's duty. She extended her helping hand without hesitation. Hearing Amber's words, Nolan sincerely felt warmth and security in his heart. 
he stretched out his right hand and expressed gratefully. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Nolan, and I will definitely repay you in the future. Amber had been wearing brown gloves, but now she swiftly removed them, revealing a bright sunny smile on her fair face as she shook the youth's hand. I'm Amber, outrider of the Knights of Favonius. Amber has developed good feelings towards you. Obtain 20 affection points. Current affection level, LV.1, 21 hundredths. Feeling the warmth transmitted from Amber's palm, Nolan suddenly didn't feel as cold despite his soaked clothing. Seeing the affection points notification, just becoming acquainted gave 20 points, probably related to Amber's helpful nature. There is still a long way to go to get a max level. He should seize any chance to gain Amber's affection, it was another way to improve himself. The arch and empowerment from reaching max level couldn't be weak with such harsh requirements right? Well, it was good to have dreams. What if they actually came true? With Amber the Outrider by his side, the owner of a vision no less, Nolan no longer needed to worry about danger in Whispering Woods. The forest was larger than he expected. Amidst the gloom, he could occasionally spot the pale blue-white glow emitted by lamp grass. As he followed Amber towards Mondstadt City, Nolan tried asking about the situation there. For example, whether any major incidents had occurred recently in Mondstadt, this was his indirect attempt at finding out if the Stormtra crisis had happened yet. Amber seemed puzzled and said everything had been peaceful in Mondstadt lately. Through their casual chat, based on information she unintentionally revealed, Nolan could roughly ascertain that the Traveler, Luminor Ether, had not arrived in Mondstadt yet, so the main storyline probably hadn't kicked off either. That was good news. Although unseen in-game, he knew the Dragon Calamity had caused considerable damage to Mondstadt. He preferred not facing it entirely unprepared. Though he wondered how much adventure EXP defeating Stormtrooper would grant, no, too dangerous. That was beyond what his current weak self could participate in. As thoughts spun in his mind, Nolan noticed the surroundings gradually brightening. They were finally about to leave the forest. Nolan, hurry up and look right, that's Mondstadt City. Amber suddenly broke into a jog, her white over-knee boots lightly stepping across the road outside the forest, before turning back and waving at Nolan. The not-too-intense sunlight illuminated her already fair face even more dazzlingly. The red bunny ears on her head swayed slightly, appearing oh so sunny and cute. They were finally arriving, at Mondstadt City. Nolan quickened his pace to catch up. Gazing afar, what entered his vision were the solid city walls, the single stone bridge filled with pedestrians. Horse carts transporting goods passing by. How is it? Spectacular, right? He he. Amber smiled and asked. Well, it's the first time I've seen such magnificent city walls. Nolan chose words befitting his identity. After all, Liu Harbor lacked walls. Walking further ahead, from the corner of his eyes Nolan spotted a teleport waypoint on a nearby hill. Noticing his gaze, Amber didn't stop and simply said. These strange devices are pretty common huh? No one knows what they do, just ignore them. They can be frequently seen in Liu too. Nolan casually replied. Of course, he knew Tevat's waypoints weren't just for show. They should utilize Li lines for long distance transfers, though currently only the traveler can use them for some reason. If he could utilize them too that'd be great, he should test it out when possible. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 3, Chapter 3, Methods to Gain Adventure EXP. Mondstadt City, the gates area. As expected, everything was far larger than what was shown in the game. The streets near the city gates bustled with many peddlers and pedestrians. Since his clothes had gotten wet, Amber knew Nolan had been robbed penniless by the treasure holders, so she paid out of her own pocket to buy him a suitable outfit from a nearby store that sells clothes. It cost over 5,000 mora, very ordinary clothing. At first hearing the number gave him a shock but he quickly realized Mora differed from his original currency. About one US dollar was equal to 100 Mora it seemed. The Mora coins created through Rex Lapis Divine Powers sure existed in massive quantities. They should have been endlessly manufactured ever since the first Mora was born, only stopping temporarily after Rex Lapis passed on the Gnosis. Since Mora itself held intrinsic value as a medium of exchange, it would inevitably get used up over time so there was no need to worry about rampant inflation from overproduction. I'm truly grateful to you again Amber. I wouldn't have known what to do if we hadn't met. After changing into dry clothes, Nolan felt much more comfortable. Amber then brought him to Good Hunter restaurant for lunch. Amber sighed and said with a straight face. It's my duty after all. 
for you to be robbed by treasure hoarders within Mondstadt territory shows our Knights of Favonia still haven't done enough. Don't worry, I'll help keep an eye out for the hoarders during my patrols and try recovering your lost goods as much as possible. Hearing Amber say this, guilt welled up in Nolan's heart. Should he not have deceived her? He opened his mouth but no words came out. Right, what are your plans next? If you wish to return to Liu, our knights can request some Liu trade convoys to bring you back. Or if you stay in Mondstadt, we will also provide you with a temporary place to live. Amber asked as she looked over at Nolan and pondered for a moment. Then she put on the gloves she had taken off during the meal and waited for Nolan's answer. He didn't need to think this over at all. Returning to Liu Mentri setting back to his initial state upon arrival, Nolan could only continue spinning his lies. He pondered for a moment and said. If possible, I'd like to find work and live in Mondstadt for a while. Going back to Liu like this, I'd be looked down on and laughed at by others. Nolan put his palms together sincerely making a begging gesture. He had his own thoughts. If the knights provided temporary lodging, he could search for a job that granted both adventure EXP and Mora. Nolan had already thought about it. Just now he saw someone selling fish at the entrance of the city, and the business was not bad. He could fish to earn adventure EXP while also selling the catches for Mora for income. Once he became stronger via EXP, he would switch to being an adventurer since defeating monsters was the optimal way to obtain adventure EXP. If his plan worked out and he remained prudent, in time he could rival even an archon with his mere mortal body. Is this a boy's pride? Amber's forefinger slid up and down her cheek as she recalled Lisa's words before about how boys cared about face. When they got into such situations, it was best to just go along with them. Sigh, all right then. Um, you do have a point, so let me take you to a temporary place to live now. Amber had no reason to reject Nolan's request. She got up to lead him to the relief shelter set up by the knights for people in difficulties. After all, people like Nolan who came to trade but encountered robberies would occasionally be there. Thus relief shelters were essential infrastructure in Mondstadt, and it was also a place for emergency response in the event of an unforeseen disaster. A day later, after Amber finished making arrangements for him under the guise of a victim of misfortune, Nolan started pondering how to obtain adventure EXP. Once he became stronger, what couldn't he accomplish? So gaining adventure EXP had to be his top priority. The method of obtaining it was defeating opponents. As long as he overwhelmed the other side until they couldn't resist at all, even fish could provide EXP contributions. Of course, the number of adventure EXP depends on the strength of the opponent. Fish only gave 5 points while the first slime he met granted 32. Yet that was still the weakest monster that even ordinary people could handle alone. But Nolan wasn't strong enough right now, and it was dangerous to go directly to fight the monsters. So just like his earlier thoughts, he would start off gathering adventure EXP from the fish to get through the weak early stage. Catching fish with his bare hands was far too slow though. Nolan recalled the emergency 30,000 Mora Amber had lent him and wondered if he could buy a fishing net to catch fish faster and easier. Thinking in this way, Nolan walked out of the small and simple temporary residence. After spending some time familiarizing himself in Mondstadt City which wasn't that unfamiliar, he finally located a fishing gear shop and went in to ask. Boss, how much for a fishing net? The shop owner was a middle-aged balding man with white hair, bony features but still seeming quite spry in his movements despite the age. Sandburn wore a light brown vest, his entire bearing resembling an elderly gentleman. Noticing Nolan, he set down the cup he had been wiping. Oh? A customer. How surprising, and rare to see someone from Liu Tu. Mondstadt welcomes you, friend from afar. What kind of net were you looking for? I am indeed from Liu, sir. I need a durable, sturdy fishing net. Any good recommendations, preferably on the cheaper end? Nolan spoke with a calm expression. He was still a little unclear about the fishing gear. What he wanted was a cheap fishing net that could catch fish. After all, this was not something he would do for a long time. Moreover, the 30,000 Mora borrowed from Amber can't be spent too much in this, or else life will be very tight in the days to come. Sandburn's eyes swept Nolan probably also guessed that the Liu person in front of him was new to Mondstadt, and likely faced some financial difficulties. After thinking a bit, he slowly replied. HRMM, my shop here only sells top-grade gear. All nets are from a famous Mondstadt fishing equipment factory, so there's no way for cheap bargains. Speaking so, he turned and walked deeper inside, placing the cup in his hands on a table. From a wool hook, 
he took down a fishing net and said to Nolan not far away. This net originally cost 13,000 mora. I'll sell it to you for 10,000. Made by Thorn Fishing Gear Factory, as you know their trait is durable sturdiness. Apologies, I don't know them at all. After all, he had only come to Tevat for a little over a day. All his information originated from playing Genshin Impact before, the game definitely wouldn't elaborate in such minute details as fishing net manufacturer identities. Nolan stroked his chin. 10,000 for a net was still rather suitable. Converted to his original currency, roughly 100 US dollars which was common for fishing nets. It showed the boss had indeed given a discount already. All right, I'll take it. Having decided, Nolan didn't waste words and directly purchased it. Ha ha, great. Head to Springvale Lake tonight to cast your net. With some luck you'll harvest plenty fat catches by morning. Eat your fill then sell the excess early before noon when prices drop. Before retirement, Sanburn had been a fisherman himself thus knew many common tips in the trade. Hence he opened this gear shop after retiring. Casting nets didn't have high difficulty. Success depended on location and luck for the most part. Just casual advice for now. Nolan nodded his head, indicating that he understood what the boss said was similar to what he thought. Before leaving, he bought some more bait, then eagerly made his way out the gates, observing along the bank of Springvale Lake for suitable net throwing spots. Because of the lack of a small boat, it was impossible to go to the center of the lake, so he could only make do with what he had, watching the depth of the water to cast the fishing net, and then sprinkle the bait, waiting for tomorrow. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 4 Chapter 4, Fishing and Selling Fish Early in the morning, the sky was still dark. There weren't many people in the streets and alleys yet, but the shops and workshops for the morning market were busy preparing to open. Some fully geared adventurers had risen early, walking towards Catherine to take on commissions and earn more, better to have funds for drinks later at Angel's Share Tavern tonight. Among them was Nolan, here to retrieve his net. After an entire night passed, the amount of harvest depends on luck. Mondstadt wasn't a fishing focus nation after all. Though some did work in the trade, not many, conveniently avoiding overfishing issues. So Nolan wasn't worried about not having a single fish, and that was on the premise of having bait. Stepping on the dewy grass, he walked Springvale Lake's bank once more. The dampness on his shoes likely came from the lakeside fog during nighttime. A few minutes passed, and Nolan came to the location of yesterday's fishing nets. A wooden stick was inserted into the soil, and the fishing net was pulled out about 15 meters along the stick, which was not very big, and the shadows of the fish could be seen vaguely through the clear water. Nolan grew somewhat excited. All he needed to do now was pull the net back in. So heavy. Only by grasping the net could its weight be felt. Seemed he made the right choice selling fish for a living, otherwise, how would a normal person like him easily gain adventure exp? It took some effort to haul the net back onto shore. Plenty of fish both big and small got caught inside. Mostly common ones like Glaze Medica, Red Belly Medica, Black Back Perch plus a few Betty Bitterling. Defeated Powerful Enemy 13, obtained 65 Adventure EXP. At this time, they were in a state of defenselessness, and without the need to kill them, they were judged to be successfully defeated by Nolan. If it wasn't for the fact that they could only be defeated once, it would be more perfect to raise them and brush them over and over again. Unfortunately, no such loopholes existed. But there were still benefits, such as he didn't have to sell the dead fish and could sell them more easily. Removing the fish one by one from the net into a wooden tub, careful counting showed 13 catches, 5 EXP each totaling 65. Added to his previous 47, he now had 112. Exceeding 100 at last, enough to raise his level. He felt rather expectant over what would happen. Few Nolan took a deep breath, opened the character panel and put Adventure EXP into the level section. With a single thought the operation finished, and the number one behind level flickered twice before slowly changing into two. Name, Nolan Walker. Level, LV.20200. Race, Human. Title, None. Innate Talent, Entangling Affection. Skills, None. Specialty, Descender. Adventure EXP, 12. No major changes occurred on his character panel yet a clear, comfortable stream of warmth suddenly emerged within his body. Like radiation, this energy slowly encompassed every cell, nourishing and strengthening them. He could feel himself growing stronger bit by bit. Strengthening time is very fast. 
Nolan's physical appearance has not changed much, still so ordinary, but he clearly feels that he has become much stronger. Strength, agility, endurance, spirit, and even life force all improved comprehensively. Scars on his arm from childhood tumbles had vanished without a trace. If he were to face that hydro slime again, he believed that he would be able to defeat it head on with his bare hands without the help of the environment. This didn't merely represent physical augmentation, but racial evolution, and elevation of the vital level. Most intuitively shown through Nolan's lifespan increasing accordingly as well. Although he didn't know exactly how much it had been enhanced, this was indeed what he felt when his body was strengthened. In the long term, perhaps there would never come a day when his lifespan ended, who didn't desire longevity. Nolan felt very relaxed in both body and mood, incentivizing collecting adventure EXP even more. Advancing the schedule of becoming an adventurer had to happen faster since defeating monsters represented the proper approach for obtaining EXP. Though for that, he would need to learn combat skills and techniques, not knowing how to start currently. While pondering, he recast his net and sprinkled more fish bait before carrying the tub of catches back to the city to sell off. At the gates area and thanks to arriving early for a prime spot, business went very smoothly. As food, fresh fish would never lack buyers, especially with just 13 catches that didn't even count as a tiny fraction for Mondstadt's massive population base, soon sold out. On average each fish sold for 1,200 mora, totaling 15,600 income for the batch, immediately recouping his net costs. When funds allowed more leeway after a few more days, he could return Amber's borrowed mora and rent a place for himself then. The rescue center is not only remote but also small, so it's fine for short-term living, but it's too uncomfortable for long-term. Nothing more he could do today for fishing, have to wait till tomorrow's catches. But collecting adventure EXP still needed continuous momentum. Nolan asked at several restaurants, checking if they lacked back kitchen helpers or workers to process livestock and seafood, representing another stable income and EXP source if he could get such a position. Unfortunately, they all said they had enough staff and didn't need any. Feeling tired after all the walking, Nolan slumped onto a street bench to catch his breath and gazed blankly at the azure sky, deep in thought. Suddenly from the corner of his eyes, he glimpsed a burly uncle dressed like a hunter passing by. The uncle carried a hunting bow on his back, furry animal ears poked from above his head while he sported a moustache below his lips and chin. Nolan's thoughts jumped and some memories came back to him, he seemed to be the chief of hunters in Springvale not far away from Mondstadt City, Diana's father, Driff. Wait, hunter. Nolan realized that if he wanted to become an adventurer, he still lacked combat skills and techniques, but to learn those required someone to teach him. Thinking so, becoming a hunter would make a good transitional job. Also needing to traverse the wilderness, hunters wielded formidable hunting skills too, just against beasts instead of monsters. If he followed Druff to learn the hunter trade, later gaining self-sufficiency surviving outdoors, then becoming an adventurer wouldn't be far off. Moreover, even beasts should provide considerable adventure XP gains when hunted, he guessed. Hunting would also be able to utilize the entire daytime gap when there was nothing to do for the time being after fishing and selling fish. So the problem became. Could he convince Truff to teach hunting experience and techniques to him, even letting Nolan tag along on hunts? Watching Truff walk further and further away, Nolan pondered briefly before chasing to catch up anyway. How do you know it won't work if you don't try? Hunter sir, please wait. Nolan called out to Druff without revealing familiarity, in case of misunderstandings. The furry ear Druff halted his steps, unexpectedly turning around to eye this Lee youth who stopped him and said, just now I noticed that you have been looking at me with a hesitant look. Is there something wrong? As an experienced hunter with a subtle sense of the environment, Drift noticed the source of the sight from the moment Nolan turned his gaze towards him. However, he just assumed that Nolan was curious. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Hunter's Archery. Nolan pondered for a moment, then spoke. Um, it's like this, Hunter sir. May I ask if you take apprentices? I've always wanted to become an adventurer but I'm not too confident in my own abilities, so I wish to first become a hunter and learn wilderness survival skills and experience. Reality is not a game, at least in his choice of words, Nolan felt he should be more respectful. Driff was a bit surprised that someone actually wanted to become his apprentice. <laughs> Having an apprentice to help out would reduce his workload. But the moro he earned from hunting was barely enough to support his family and drinking habits. How could he afford to pay an apprentice? 
Draff awkwardly rubbed the back of his head and rejected politely with an embarrassed smile. Ha ha, young man. You don't need extremely formidable abilities to become an adventurer. Helping run errands and do chores in the city still makes you an adventurer. What Draff said did make sense. Becoming an adventurer was very simple, but an adventurer who didn't leave the city wouldn't be able to fight monsters. An adventurer who doesn't leave the city, what kind of adventurer is that? Don't worry sir, I don't need Mora, I only wish to learn something. Nolan could see that Druff was still a little bit interested, but what factors could make him refuse? Thinking about the fact that he had a love for drinking, maybe it was the problem of Mora. Seeing the Lil youth's earnest gaze, Druff didn't have the heart to refuse. Having an apprentice around would be greatly beneficial, at least when encountering dangerous monsters, there would be someone who could seek help from the patrolling knights of Favonius. And he could save the excess Mora. Cough. But to prevent the youth from not being able to endure hardships and disappoint him, Drift lightly coughed and said solemnly, being a hunter isn't easy, there are definite dangers and injuries happen frequently. Are you certain about this? Of course, hunter sir. I only wish to give it to try. If it doesn't work out, at least I tried my best. This is my dream. Nolan thought that Druff might still politely refuse, but he didn't expect it to go so smoothly. Druff crossed his arms and gazed at the street ahead, pondering for a bit. Then he lowered his arms and said. All right. While I don't know what considerations you have, and we're still strangers upon our first meeting, since you're willing to give it a try, I, Druff, am no petty man either. I'll take you for one month. What you can learn is up to your own capability. He also harbored thoughts of propagating his hunting skills to later generations. The town's youth nowadays were all unwilling to follow in the older generation's footsteps, thinking only of running off to the cities. Sigh. Coming across a Liu youth who was willing to learn now, teaching him wouldn't hurt. When the youth returns to Liu in the future, he might brag to others about the amazing hunter master he met in Mondstadt. Drift's thoughts started wandering off. Really? Thank you, hunter I mean, Sir Drift. I will learn diligently. Nolan held back his excitement. His path of growth was progressing again, and the day he could gallivant freely in Tevat was drawing near. After calming down, Nolan briefly introduced himself and asked Druff when they would start hunting. Nolan huh. Lee names really are easy to pronounce or it's just you? Hearing his introduction, Druff lamented feelingly. Then he said solemnly, let's have our hunting session in the afternoon. I just finished my business in the city and still need to return to Springvale. Wait for me at the city gates later. Of course, Sir Drif. Thank you. Nolan bowed slightly again to express his gratitude. All right, no need to be so formal with distant courtesy. We're not in a teacher-student relationship, just see it as seniors and juniors of hunting exchanging experiences. Drif waved his hand and said with a smile. Nolan saw him off as he walked away on the stone-paved road, filled with anticipation for the afternoon. With leisurely time still available, Nolan continued wandering Mondstadt's streets and familiarizing himself with everything. Time flowed by swiftly like water. In the afternoon, Nolan put on the exercise outfit Amber bought for him with 5,000 Mora. He arrived at the city gates to wait for Drift. Speaking of which, he should return those 5,000 Mora to Amber for the clothes later, can't take advantage of the girl. Nolan didn't have to wait long before Druff appeared, dressed in hunter's garb. He carried a hunting bow on his back while holding another in his hand, which he passed to Nolan saying. This is the bow I used previously, very suitable for archery basics, use it for now. Nolan took it. This was the first time in his life that he had come into contact with a bow and arrow. On the surface, it looked a bit old, but there was no damage at all. It was quite good. Following Druff's guidance, he properly equipped the hunting bow and quiver finally resembling somewhat like a hunter's apprentice. Not bad. Driff nodded with some satisfaction, then said ponderingly, I agreed to take you along for guidance, but there's another reason. Another reason? Nolan was puzzled. Driff smiled and explained. Recently, there have been more wild beasts in the Whispering Woods and Stormbearer Mountains area. There is a possibility that it will affect people's travel. So the knights suggested us Springvale hunters could hunt more here. I think there are more prey than I can possibly take alone, in order to avoid wastage by then, I'll ask you to work a little harder. Of course, isn't that exactly what an apprentice should do? Nolan said happily. Perhaps Druff felt having an extra person to share hunting experiences wasn't much, but to Nolan, this was tremendously important, learning archery would greatly boost his combat ability. 
Haha, young people should be so energetic. Let's go, whether it's the craft of hunting or experience, the fastest way to learn is through practice. Drift patted Nolan's shoulder, signaling him to follow. The two crossed Mondstadt Bridge, startling some pigeons that were foraging. The fresh scent of grass brushed past their cheeks in the breeze. On the route to the hunt, Drift said to Nolan. For Springvale's hunting skills, one must first learn the bow. It was supposed to be taught from a young age to the younger generation to use it, and when you have learned it for a few years, you can follow the adults to hunt and further learn the other skills. Archery is difficult to grasp. It'll be pretty good if you can get basics in a month. For now, start with holding the bow. Holding the bow wasn't hard. The key was stability, as stability was archery's foundation. Without stability, how could one shoot accurately? While heading towards Whispering Woods, Druff began coaching Nolan on a hunter's archery. The basics of holding the bow, picking up arrows, how to shoot to conserve stamina and conceal yourself. This was an archery solely meant for hunting. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 6, Chapter 6, A Trial Run, Hunting Boar. Whispering Woods, the environment was dark. By now Nolan had basically grasped the key points of a hunter's archery. In Druff's words, next was spending time practicing more to familiarize and master the various techniques to gain a foundation. His character panel skills section now displayed Hunter's Archery LV.10100, representing he could swiftly upgrade it using Adventure EXP. Unfortunately, there are only 12 EXP, so it's completely impossible to do so. Nolan carried a backpack, following Druff ahead of him. Suddenly Druff crouched down halfway, eyeing fresh mud prints on the ground and said, Wild boar tracks, let's follow them. Drift's footsteps were very light, semi-concealing his form with shrubs and trees in a half-crouching stance as he proceeded forth. Whenever his body touched branches or leaves, he would study them to prevent noises startling the wild boar. Nolan imitated accordingly. By this point Druff could no longer vocally instruct him. After all, even slight sounds could alert prey after all. Observing attentively was essential for qualifying as a hunter. After a few minutes, Nolan heard a boar's content grunts as it rooted around for food. The two hid themselves behind a large tree. That wild boar had a brown-red appearance, same as the in-game model. This reminded Nolan of some unpleasant memories exploring Tevat, randomly getting slammed by wild boars while traveling. Drift turned and signaled at him, before removing an arrow from the quiver behind and knocking it on his hunting bow. His movements weren't rushed yet very quiet, intentionally letting Nolan observe and learn. Nolan understood and watched earnestly. Drift took aim at the feasting boar after drawing back the bowstring. In a breeze-like instant, the arrow shot forth without much noise, accurately piercing the boar's front hoof making it release pain squeals. Nolan, it can't escape now, I'll leave the rest for you to practice on, Drift said. A hunter's archery originated from insights during the hunt after all. Hunting made for the best teacher. Got it. Nolan had been eager to try. He wondered how much adventure EXP this boar would provide. Recalling Druff's bow handling guidance, he knocked an arrow and took aim at the boar frantically crashing around whining from its injured leg. His level 2 physique felt easy drawing the wooden bow, even impressing Druff. As soon as he let go, the arrow flew out from the string. Thunk. It struck a tree, barely evaded by the boar's chaotic flailing. First shots understandably lacked some accuracy. The second arrow hit the boar's hind leg. Nolan actually felt awful for making the boar suffer more. The third arrow finally ended the rampaging beast by striking true through its forehead. Defeated a powerful enemy, obtained 20 adventure EXP. The familiar notification rang out. A boar with 20 EXP was equivalent to two-thirds of a small-sized slime, which wasn't bad at all. Slimes were monsters wielding elemental energy after all, naturally somewhat stronger than wild beasts. I've taught you archery fundamentals already. You just lack practice for entry level now. Wild boars are too heavy to carry far. We'll retrieve this one later when leaving. Driff observed Nolan's shooting process and gave an approving nod, ordering them to conceal the boar first before continuing on. Due to some unknown reason the wild beast numbers increased greatly around Whispering Woods and Storm Bearer Mountains lately. Thus there were many hunters here hunting. Most were residents of Springvale. They got to know this lee looking youth. Regarding hunting they were willing to give pointers, benefiting Nolan tremendously. Phew it's dusk. Drift glanced at the setting sun while wiping sweat from his brow. Let's call it a day and come back tomorrow. Very well, Sir Drift. Nolan slightly nodded. 
today's gains weren't bad. Aside from the first or two more got encountered later which Truff claimed as rarely seen luck. Aside from those, one wild rabbit, two foul, and considering Nolan needed live practice for his archery, Druff would first injure the prey before letting him finish them off, granting better training effect. The boar gave 20 EXP, rabbit 10, foul 10 each. In total, Nolan earned 90 adventure EXP that afternoon. Just two more days until level up probably. Meanwhile under Druff's guidance and practice, his hunter's archery rose slightly without investing any EXP. Now it is Hunter's Archery LV.1, 12 100. If he did put in those 90 EXP, it could instantly boost to next level. But Nolan chose not to. He preferred reserving precious adventure EXP for level ups, while he could still ask Drift to teach him about Hunter's Archery in the near future, so a little bit of saving doesn't hurt at all. Because of the excessive prey, Drift and Nolan couldn't carry it all back themselves. Luckily Springvale had its own transport team. Return trips often had several carts collecting all hunters' quarries all together to deliver into Mondstadt City. There were specialized merchants to purchase them, so no need to worry much. Due to the good hunting harvest today, despite him clearly saying he didn't need Mora for following Drift to learn, the latter still split some profits with Nolan, 20,000 Mora. It counted as a day's normal income, and Nolan did lack money, so he didn't decline too much. Anyway, between fishing and hunting now Nolan finally had sources of income, no need to worry about starving to death in this foreign world. Both also provided adventure EXP for his own growth, overall not too bad. A long night passed away. At dawn, like yesterday Nolan went to collect his fishing net. But upon reaching yesterday's location, he suddenly discovered the wooden peg used to mark and pull the net was gone. Nolan's heart skipped a beat. Taking a closer look, the fishing net was missing too. What was going on? Could some big fish gotten caught and tore the net away? Nolan examined the hole left by the peg in the soil. It didn't seem like the net got forcefully pulled out, but rather the peg got manually uprooted. Surely nobody would take just a few fish right? Clueless and frustrated, Nolan heaved out a vexed sigh. If another dozen or more catches waited for him today, then he just lost at least several dozen adventure EXP now. And that brand new net bought with Mora, gone after one use. If he found out who did this, he would absolutely make them pay dearly. After circling the lakeside fruitlessly for clues, Nolan gloomily prepared to leave. This bizarre occurrence made him rather reluctant trying to buy and fish here again, only to get stolen once more, that would certainly feel awful since he couldn't monitor the net forever. Unfortunately the distance from the gates made it unlikely any patrolling Mondstadt knights would notice this area. Otherwise he could have asked if they saw anyone approaching around this spot, obtaining some leads to maybe locate the thief. Nothing he could do now except swallow this dumb loss. As Nolan moved to depart, pondering ways to salvage his Mora and EXP income stream, perhaps he could cooperate with local fishermen, use Mora to directly purchase catches, gain EXP after defeating the fish, then resell them? No good, whether to sell at cost price or tacking on a small premium posed an issue. Two high-end people would just go elsewhere better priced, two low men no profits for himself. Just then, his right foot seemed to step on something hard. Glancing down after lifting his foot, a coppery metallic object got trodden on. He bent down and picked it up, wiping away the mud on its surface. Its complete shape emerged, round, like a badge. There was embossing on it, the pattern depicting a bird curled up around something. In the next moment, Nolan was struck by sudden realization. Wasn't this the treasure-seeking raven insignia he often farmed for treasure in-game? Treasures under raven's wing, identifying badge for members of the treasure holders. The treasure-seeking raven insignia. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 7, Chapter 7, Level Up. The treasure-seeking raven insignia represented the identity of treasure hoarder members. Besides them, no one else would carry this on them, lest they get reported to the Knights of Favonius for questioning if discovered. The treasure hoarders scoured all over trying various means to uncover hidden stashes of treasure unknown to others. On top of stealing and robbery, their villainous reputation was extremely notorious. They practically ranked as public enemies that everyone in Tevat reviled. It wasn't hard to deduce why this insignia appeared here. Treasure hoarders passing by likely noticed some rare, valuable fish gotten caught in his net by chance. With their philosophy of doing anything for Mora, they certainly wouldn't let such easily obtained wealth slip by. TSK, who knew the casually made-up story of getting robbed by treasure hoarders would become true now. 
while other possibilities existed, discovering this dropped insignia here made that the greatest possibility. As such, he definitely wouldn't swallow this loss. Sooner or later they would have to spit out everything taken from him doubled. Nolan swore internally. More than just the Mora, this also represented precious adventure EXP losses. He didn't obtain much daily, how could it be easy to bear? Standing on the verdant grass pondering for a while, Nolan decided to shelve this matter first. Aside from needing time to locate them, whether he could even beat the treasure hoarders still posed an issue. His current level 2 self might not necessarily triumph against them. He should keep focusing on ways of gaining adventure EXP and improving himself first. Though asking around for treasure hoarder until his preliminary steps didn't hurt. When afternoon came, Nolan still refrained from buying fish for EXP and then reselling method. Aside from wasting effort, no profits either. At the city gates, while waiting for Druff, Nolan asked two gatekeeping knights dressed in silver gold armor about the news. Say, Sir Swan, and Sir Lawrence, has the Knights of Favonius obtained any recent treasure hoarder news? Nolan, carrying the wooden hunting bow given by Giraffe, leaned against the side of the city gate and asked. Treasure hoarders? Doesn't seem so. Swan shrugged, metal pauldrons clinking against the queue iris. They were familiar with this Liu youth rescued and brought back by Outrider Amber. Also knew he fell into dire straits after getting robbed, so it wasn't odd he asked about this. No news huh? Bit of a pity. Nolan didn't feel too let down. Nothing could be rushed regarding these matters. Though I did hear Captain Kaya mention some suspicious fellows he ran into by the beach days ago. But occupied by other duties then, by the time he returned they'd vanished. And that's the end of that I suppose. Hopefully. This bit can aid you somehow. Dressed in the same Favonius armor, Lawrence stroked his chin trying to recall the details to relay. Storm to Reslair Beach? Nolan ponders a bit. Since it already happened days prior, likely not much viability for follow-ups anymore. Though that area by the seaside held abundant hydro elements, frequently spawning hydro slimes. He could search there later when monster hunting. Much appreciated Sir Lawrence. It's still a lead of sorts I guess. Maybe some harvests if I trace things from there. Nolan smiled and said. Perhaps so. Lawrence scratched his head. But if you do want to investigate, best to bring Miss Amber along. She is our reconnaissance expert, most suited for such tasks. Yes, and if you really do encounter treasure hoarders, Miss Amber can protect you as well, Swan added solemnly. After all in their eyes, this Liu youth wasn't some vision wielder. He only started learning hunting from Springvale's hunting chief for these couple days. Surely not that capable yet. Seeing their worried expressions, Nolan earnestly said. Don't worry, I won't go without certainty and preparations. Of course, if Miss Amber has time I'll also invite her to assist. It's good that you understand yourself. The two knights didn't elaborate further. Right then, Nolan spotted Drift waving at him from afar by the Mondstadt bridge, signaling their hunting departure time. He bid the knights farewell for now. Carefully dodging pedestrians on the bridge. Nolan jogged to meet up with Drift. Seeing you chat so merrily with Swan and Lawrence, I didn't come over. But we gotta hurry now, other hunters from our village already gone ahead into the woods. Latecomers like us get nothing if we delay more. Drift said with a smile as he looked out over the whispering woods. How can that be, Sir Drift's hunting skills are so formidable after all. Nolan performed an astonished reaction cooperatively. This has nothing to do with good or bad. Us Springvale hunters around the same generation, our hunting skills tempered over decades generally differ little. For a bountiful harvest, the key is to go first. Like conversing with a junior, Drift shared his experience. Arrive before others, gain the spoils first. It does make sense. Drift's words reminded Nolan of the early bird gets the worm. Prey and opportunities are often singular. Slower by a step meant eternally slower by that step. Perhaps the analogy wasn't too accurate, but the meaning got across. What followed was similar to yesterday. Drift coached Nolan on using Hunter's archery while hunting. Upon discovering prey he injured them first, leaving the finishing blow for Nolan's practice. Through such practical battles, Nolan progressed swiftly, just as Drift said, hunting itself was the best way to train Hunter's archery while gaining deeper comprehension and experience. Hunter's archery emphasized steady, precise. Agile, unexpected shots, finally integrating with body maneuvers to conceal yourself so prey discovered you first. Grasping these basics meant entry level. For the next month, Nolan thus followed Drift in and out of Whispering Woods and Storm Bearer Mountains. 
he made plentiful harvests daily, directly selling the spoils to various merchants back in Mondstadt. He averaged around 10,000 more income daily. After a month passed his savings reached 355,600 mora, roughly equaling 3,000 plus USD. Not huge but ample to escape poverty. More importantly, Druff discovering most prey first before letting him practice granted considerable adventure exp gains that he always invested first thing upon reaching the threshold for level ups. Presently he reached level 6, Hunter's Archery relying on diligent practice also hit level 2. Several hundred adventure exp still remained that would let him rise further soon. Now Nolan's character panel became like this. Name, Nolan Walker. Level, LV.60600. Race, human. Title, none. Innate talent, entangling affection. Skills, hunters archery LV.2, 122 200. Specialty, descender. Adventure XP, 512. His comprehensive abilities like strength and speed at level 6 could thrash his former self. By Druff's judgment, Nolan could hunt independently now. Druff also felt exceptionally astonished at Nolan's growth speed. While marksmanship still needed improvements, his physical qualities already compensated well enough for those flaws. Of course, Nolan understood that presently he only exceeded ordinary folks by a fair margin, still a bit away from veterans like Druff or the Favonius Knights after years of specialized training. Tavat continent and the reality are fundamentally different. The energy level is much higher than the earth, so the spirit that nurtures it is also much stronger than the earth. Each other cannot be generalized. End of chapter. To be continued. Chapter 8, Chapter 8, Knights of Favonius. All right, after over a month of hunting, the beast numbers in Whispering Woods and Storm Bearer Mountains returned to normal levels, and won't skyrocket again in the short term. I need to take a good rest and then have a big drink after a month of consecutive work. From now on you'll have to rely on yourself. The light of the setting sun, caressing the emerald green of the earth, colored Tavat in an intoxicating golden hue. Druff, who kept his moustache and stubble neatly trimmed, once more sold off today's spoils. Standing at the end of Mondstadt Bridge, he heartily patted Nolan's shoulder and said earnestly. Regardless, Nolan was a junior that followed him a whole month. Drift still hoped he could make something of himself whether as hunter or adventurer. Don't worry Sir Drift, I won't disappoint you. After a month's growth, Nolan felt much more self-assured compared to when he first arrived lost and confused. His words turned relaxed too. Ha ha, great. Visit me at Springvale Town when you've time. Drift guffawed loudly and waved, getting ready to leave. His fellow hunting buddies back in town waited impatiently. I'll be sure to and I'll have good hunter's best bartender mix their finest liquor over. Nolan smiled while calling out to Druff's departing back. Sure enough, Druff shuddered instantly upon hearing that, hastily turning back and urging. No no, never bring cat's tails drinks. Nolan looked at him puzzled. Realizing his lapse in composure, Druff lightly coughed and smoothed it over. I mean their liquors don't quite suit my taste. Angels shares grape wines fit me better, yes, that's right. If Nolan bought cat's tail mixes saying they were for Springvale's village chief, his daughter Dinah would surely erupt again over her most hated drunkard dad business. He clearly knew his daughter stood as cat's tail's best bartender. Ha ha ha, very well Sir Drift, safe travels. Nolan lightly laughed and waved. Drift turned round and said, fine, in the future, if you want to learn the hunting from me remember to bring wine. Due to a full month of continuous hunting. It had been long since he heartily drank to their heart's content with the townsfolk. After all alcohol affected cognition, not staying clear-headed in the wilderness was dangerous. With work done now was precisely time to celebrate back home. Thinking of that, Drift's footsteps lightened considerably. Under the golden sunlight, on the grassy path, the hunter hummed a tune. The evening breeze gently lingered, gaze following long after the senior willing to help him, and the youth felt truly grateful. Returning citizens trickled back to Mondstadt in pairs and threes. Unharmed adventurers safely back he even gathered at Angel's share over drinks, toasting the Anemo Archon's blessings. In over a month at Mondstadt, Nolan kept a low profile. Perhaps due to his personality, he didn't befriend many. But that wasn't because he was introverted or socially awkward, it was just a way of his lifestyle. Even so, his understanding towards Mondstadt's various facets grew much deeper now, perfectly integrating himself into the city. Nolan didn't head back immediately, 
instead walking towards the Knights of Favonius direction. Time to return the money owed to Amber. This past month she frequently dropped by the relief shelter to check on him, even asking if he lacked funds. Her thoughtfulness truly touched Nolan. So with no monetary woes for now, he should return Amber's money soonest. Nolan disliked owing others. Mondstadt's layout was rather special. Walking in from the gates, the terrain elevates with higher areas further in. The lowermost section were residential and commercial districts for citizens. Midway up was where the Knights of Favonius headquarters lied quite a distance needing stairs to reach, honestly quite tiring. At the peak was the plaza with an enormous Barbatos statue. People liked strolling here during their free time. Any events or announcements also generally held here. And at Mondstadt's utmost summit was the Cathedral of the Anemo Archon, displaying Mondstadt's respect for Lord Barbatos. After all it resembled nations on earth with divine right of kings. Except for the king here was the Anemo Archon himself. His sole management philosophy for Mondstadt was my people are free to do as they please. Outstandingly hands off, sounded nice when phrased as freedom. Actually, he was too lazy managing anything. Thus the Knights of Favonius managed most affairs under normal circumstances, doing quite a decent job too. Though a darker age of aristocrat rule did exist long ago. Amidst these meandering thoughts, Nolan finally arrived before the pale stone three-story knight's headquarters. Two Favonius guards stood stationed at the entrance. Seemed around shift ending time judging by their spirits. One wore glasses while the other didn't. Nolan frequented this location often when playing, but no longer recalled any names beyond key characters. Most players cared not for minor NPCs after all. Nolan could directly enter the inner headquarters. Mondstadt's greatest library lies inside, open to the public, and managed by librarian Lisa. Though routine inquiries still occurred to prevent vandals, Despite the low probability, after all, this was the stronghold of Mondstadt's mightiest warriors. Only lunatics would think to kick up trouble here. Just picture it, newly entering the Great Hall, Lisa's office on the left, library on the right, the notorious Witch of Purple Rose as librarian right there. Those two tended to stay put daily for work. Imagining potential scenarios already felt dreadful. Hello there. Nolan got intercepted by the guarding knight Portos, who first performed the Favonius salute and greeted him, then asked. What business brings you to the headquarters? If you wish to borrow books from the library, I'm afraid librarian Lisa already went off work during this break period. Visitors during this break time surprised Portos somewhat. Irregularities always demanded extra awareness. Moreover, the guest dressed as some Liu hunter. Things weren't too peaceful lately. First Captain Kaia spotted suspicious people at Storm to Reslair Beach. Then Outrider Amber brought back a Lee youth attacked by treasure hoarders from Whispering Woods. There had always been an ominous feeling something would happen. He should diligently fulfill his duties. Though that robbed Liu young man couldn't possibly be you, right? Portos scrutinized Nolan while thinking silently. Chapter 9, Chapter 9, Favonius Swordsmanship, Fundamentals Sir Knight, I'm not here to borrow books. May I ask if Miss Amber is around? Nolan shook his head and replied in denial. Oh? You are looking for Miss Amber? Could it be that you are the young man from Leo that she brought back? Although Portos used a questioning tone, his tone was one of certainty. Nolan wasn't surprised the knights caught wind of him. The relief shelter fell under their administration after all. Amber housing him there would inevitably inform relevant staff. With just these number of knights and internal personnel, words of the Leo youth's plight spread amongst them. Nolan nodded and smiled graciously. If it wasn't for Miss Amber's helping hand, I may have still been wandering outside now. Ha ha, how could it be? Portos similarly revealed a smile, regardless of who's in trouble, the Knights of Favonius will never stand by idly. The spectacled Knight Otto also walked over and said. That's right. Miss Amber possesses deep compassion and respectability. She should be inside headquarters currently, go on in and look for her. Very well. Nolan stepped onto the entrance stairs and pushed open the heavy wooden doors. A spacious main hall entered his sight, gaze naturally falling upon the innermost stairs to the second floor. The headquarters second floor was quite mysterious. Never unlocked in game, so no one knew what lied up there. The first room on the left, acting Grandmaster Jean's office. Despite being labeled as solitary confinement, the next room basically transformed into Clay's bomb research lab. Any new bombs that Clayard could have been researched while she was in solitary confinement, after all, when she wasn't in solitary confinement she was either digging for a great secret treasure or on her way to do so. 
The library was on the right, also guarded by a knight. Seeing no Amber after a sweep, Nolan walked over and asked, Sir Knight, is Miss Amber around? The stern-faced Twyret, posture upright as well, answered in a middle-aged man's tone. Miss Amber is at the acting Grand Master's office for work reports. Please wait for a bit. I see. Since then, Nolan could only stand by waiting. What a pity Lisa already got off work, else he could browse the library to kill time. <laughs> that night said Lisa leaving meant no book loans registered, but reading inside should still be allowed right? With people guarding here there shouldn't be worries of books getting taken either. Thus Nolan tried asking, Excuse me, Sir Knight, may I read inside the library? Warat glanced at the youth and nodded. Of course. Thank you. Also Sir Knight, could I trouble you to inform Miss Amber someone's looking for her at the library when she's done? Nolan thanked him and further inquired, in case he missed Amber exiting not seeing her inside. Ah, uh, go ahead. Receiving the same brief answer, Nolan once again expressed his thanks and gently pushed open the wooden door of the library and walked in. At a sweeping glance, the layout seemed identical to the game, split above and below with both levels filled by oceans of books. No wonder Lisa chose librarian work. Perhaps no workplace surpassed here for ideal scholarly environments. Aside from killing time waiting for Amber, another intention Nolan suddenly thought of, whether combat skill learning methods could be found in here? If he could really find it, it would be greatly convenient for Nolan to acquire different skills. It wasn't that anyone could be as happy to instruct others in archery as Druff did, so it was important to have an avenue where he could learn skills from books. Even though learning without instruction might be slow, Nolan wasn't relying on talents. As long as he managed to grasp the entry fundamentals from guides successfully until a skill registered on his character panel, raising efficiency via adventure EXP remained viable. Whether there was talent or not didn't matter. Nolan searched through the bookshelves one by one, each shelf was labelled with what type of book it was, so it didn't feel like a hassle. It had to be said that it was worthy of being the largest library in Mondstadt, basically, all types of books were there. The combat skills that Nolan wanted were also found on the wooden bookshelf on the left side of the first floor against the wall. The entire shelf contained various combat skill training methods and predecessors summarized experiences. Brimming with anticipation, Nolan randomly plucked out a book. Its cover prominently displayed Favonius swordsmanship, fundamentals in large font, clean and straightforward. He instantly recognized this taught foundations of Favonius swordsmanship. Exactly what he currently needed. Hunter's archery from Trafoni marked fledgling comprehension so far. Learning some melee skills proved necessary. He didn't immediately grab and read it, however temporarily replacing the book back on the shelf to check out other options first. Favonius Archery, Fundamentals, Universal Combat Breathing Rhythm Compendium, Mitigation Techniques Against Large Type Illichurls, Rhindot A Single-Handed Sword Play, Basic Grasping of Polyams. Perusing the many book names, some covered weapon utilization while others detailed countering specific monsters. Overall though, nothing stood out as particularly incredible or containing transcendent superhuman abilities. This made Nolan a bit disappointed. Of course, he didn't hold major expectations to begin with. In Teyvat, elemental powers were the most common supernatural forces. Humans required vision, an external magical apparatus, to utilize them. If there is no vision that can guide the elemental power, the probability of ordinary people contacting the elements rashly will be eroded, which can lead to minor illnesses or life-threatening situations. So even if the Knights has methods to handle elemental powers, such information wouldn't be casually placed on shelves, fearing curiosity might cripple some commoners practicing them. After settling his thoughts, Nolan merely took that initial Favonius swordsmanship, fundamentals to a nearby table to read. If librarian Lisa still worked he could have borrowed some back for simultaneous study and practice. Alas, rambunctiously swinging weapons round in the library breaks all kinds of regulations and etiquette. Reading revealed Favonius swordsmanship, fundamentals to be foundational swordsmanship summarized and compiled by the knights. It contained training methods for both one-handed and two-handed swords. What all Favonius knights learned, nothing unique, no wasted words, explained very clearly. Some learning experiences from senior knights were also included to reduce many detours for Nolan, faster to start. He didn't expect coming to repay Amber would discover unexpected gains at the library. Seemed Amber really was his lucky angel. He ought to properly thank her when possible. Chapter 10, Chapter 10, Dinner with Amber. The library was brightly lit and quiet. 
Amber was stopped by Wyatt when she came out of the acting grandmaster's office, hearing that a young Liu man was looking for her and was now waiting inside the library. Knowing who it was, Amber stepped into the library with her knee-high white boots on. Looking around the second floor, there was no sign of anyone. Her twitching rabbit ears picked up faint sounds of pages turning from below. Contact between moderate heels and the floor resembled melodious notes. Reaching the wooden stairs she indeed spotted Nolan at a corner downstairs. At this moment, he seemed to be concentrating on reading and did not notice Amber's approach. Amber quietly smirked hiding behind bookshelves, soundlessly sneaking around the youth's back. Stretching out her right hand, she was trying to scare him. Immersed in reading, Nolan temporarily forgot his purpose here at the headquarters. Just then a sweet floral fragrance scented his nose, breaking his concentration. This fragrance was not unfamiliar to Nolan, it seemed to be Amber's scent. Could it be that she came over? Thinking this way Nolan naturally turned his head back, when suddenly a white palm poked his cheek. Soft and tender, slightly warm. Ah! Amber flinched for a moment then withdrew her hand and hid it behind her back, laughed a little awkwardly, and said, Originally I wanted to tap your shoulder to scare you, but I didn't expect you to turn back. Of course, Nolan thought nothing of it, but he still flirted. It's fine. It's the first time I've seen the lively and enthusiastic Miss Amber like this. Such a difficult look, ha ha. Hey, you. Oh, forget it. Sir Wyatt said you were looking for me outside. What's the matter? Knowing each other for about a month, they were rather familiar. Just joking around. Amber swiftly smoothed her expression and got to the point. Oh right. Remember I borrowed Mora from you before? Here to return it. Nolan pulled over a coin pouch tied at his waist, inside were Mora of varying denominations, totaling exactly 35,000 Mora. After all, he didn't have any inventory system like games to stow it in, he could only use the pouches like ordinary folks. Huh? No need. Amber was slightly surprised and didn't think that Nolan was here to return the money. At that time, she said it was borrowed back then, but in fact, in her mind she didn't plan on asking it back. You still need more in your life right now, so just keep it for now. That won't do. I earn a steady income hunting now. Can't owe your money without returning it. Nolan grabbed Amber's wrist and firmly stuffed the more into her palm. Fine then. Amber revealed a smile without further refusal. Amber has developed good feelings towards you, obtained 50 affection points. Current affection level, LV.2, 10200. A prompt sounded in Nolan's mind. Amber's affection for him rose to LV, too. This should be a relatively slightly close relationship. Previously, when he met in the Whispering Woods, he was considered new acquaintance, and the occasional encounters over the course of a month had raised his favorability a few times. Now due to Nolan's insistence on principle again, he earned more of Amber's affection. After a short period of time, Nolan came to understand affection degrees mechanics. Generally, for most people, Affection for an unfamiliar person comes from their first impressions. Just like Nolan meeting Amber, he wasn't some egregious villain either. Kind-hearted Amber discovered someone needing help, so her initial impression wasn't bad, some fondness was normal. After getting acquainted, if not a one-sided relationship they may occasionally or often meet, then the two will naturally become familiar with each other. No need to do anything, with the deepening of mutual understanding, affection will naturally increase. Of course, the premise is that Nolan must not conduct himself in ways Amber disliked throughout this natural process. Nolan guessed Amber still saw him in an understanding phase. Over time and contact, he didn't require conscious effort. Amber would regard him as a friend sooner or later. However, that was it. Obtaining her Archon's empowerment absolutely demanded exceeding mere friendship. Nolan needed to actively look for opportunities to contact Amber, and sooner or later their relationship would evolve in quality. As an ordinary man, he just needed to socialize ordinarily. Not to show too much rush, or be gain Amber's disfavor, then it would be a waste of effort. After Amber stored the Mora, her attention was drawn by the book on the table. Curiously she asked. You wanna learn Favonius swordsmanship? Yep. In the future, I plan on traveling Tevat and becoming a powerful adventurer in the future. You can't do it with only a little bit of archery. Nolan spoke more happily about her future direction. Nice aspirations, Amber nodded. Sitting by on a chair she said, It's a pity that I'm not too good at swordsmanship, or else I could teach you. Well, there's a training ground behind the knight's headquarters with all sorts of implements, so you can go there if you're practicing swordsmanship. Great. 
I was just wondering where I could train. The training ground behind the knight's headquarters, Nolan was too familiar with it, it was the place where a young girl named Dylan often requested the traveler's guidance on swiftly destroying wooden poles. By the way, to thank Miss Amber for helping me, I would like to invite you to the Good Hunter restaurant for dinner. You shouldn't have eaten dinner at this time, right? Nolan said as he looked at Amber with a sincere gaze. This invitation was reasonable, after all, Amber did help him a lot, so buying a dinner was not wrong. Plus meals were rare chances to raise affection, can't miss it. Giving help to those in need is the duty of a knight of Favonius. How can I ask for something in return? Forget the dinner. Amber shook her head and refused. Actually, I still have something I want to ask for your help. And I heard long ago Good Hunter's sticky honey roast and spicy stew are delicious. Why don't we talk about it over dinner? Nolan unleashed his anti-Amber noble phantasm flawlessly. Sticky honey roast and spicy stew. Amber's fair-skinned neck twitched imperceptibly, her gaze brightened a bit, and then she said without haste, since you need my help, there's no other way, let's go now. Amber has developed good feelings towards you, obtained 50 affection points. Current affection level, LV.2, 6200. Let me return this book first. Nolan smiled as he placed the Favonius swordsmanship, fundamentals, which he could not register to borrow for the time being, back on the bookshelf in his original location. Sure enough, eating and giving gifts are techniques to raise affection. Almost LV.3 now, should be friends already right? Feeling rather close by this point. He entered the headquarters still during sunset moments. By the time they departed night had fallen, curtaining the skies with darkness.